in sharing. Okay. Right. Can you see the slides? Okay, yep. good. So let us get started. So uh, the, the last week we started the Fermion, so I'm going to continue on this. But the first thing I wanted to discuss with you is actually the schedule for the midterm. So uh, it, it took me a while to get the, uh, the suggestions from the department. So uh, only now I, I got to, to actually think uh, 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 about the, uh, the schedule for the midterm. And so this is my proposal. And uh, you, you let me if that works or not. And so the idea is to make it take home. And it's basically, it's going to be a homework problem, but you have to do it on your own without working with other students or consulting check or any other material. So uh, that's the, the, the difference from the uh, other homework problems. And uh, my plan is to post this midterm exam uh, uh, problem set on October 9th. So that will be next Friday and it will be due in a week, just like the homeworks are. And so I'm actually taking a risk here. So I'm putting an enormous trust in you that if you have a week, there may be sort of a um, um, uh, um, tendency or um, uh, the desire uh, to start talking to other students about this. But as I said, I'm putting a huge trust on you that you wouldn't. So I actually uh, pass around a uh, 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 the, the um, uh, commitment sheet uh, basically, that is an, it's an honor code, and you sign it that you work on the midterm, midterm uh, exam problem on your own, and and then I give you a week to avoid uh, much pressure, time pressure, to be able to work on the problem set. And I learned from some of you that, that there seem to be many midterm exams scheduled next week in many other classes, so that's why I'm I'm actually doing this actually a week later. Uh, so that's that's really meant to minimize the time pressure on you. And, and hence, you know, I'm putting a big trust in you as well. So it's, it's going to be open book. And as I said, no consultation on human beings uh, or any other material. Uh, and and uh, uh, you have to actually do all the problems on your own. So that's the idea. So does anybody have a, a problem with this uh, arrangement? Benjamin? Uh, I was curious, when you say open book, does that include like lecture notes? Yeah, okay. lecture notes included, yes. Okay, cool, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so, so th there doesn't seem to be any problems with this. So I will post the regular homework problem this Friday, uh, just like what we've been doing uh, all along. And that's a homework you can, you're welcome to work with other students. But a week later, I will post this uh, midterm exam uh, problem set. And that one, you really have to work on your own. So that's the only, really only difference between the homework problem and the midterm. All right. Any questions? Comments? So will there be a like a okay. homework that week as well? No, no, no. There, there will be no okay. homework. Yeah, that okay. will be way too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thanks. For Any other questions? Complaints? Criticisms? Okay. So uh, I uh, uh, let, let me proceed that way. Good. So we did start talking about fermions, and uh, let me just uh, continue on on that. So the first part is just a little review on what we have done, namely that instead of the usual commutation relations, we uh, got inspired from harmonic oscillator, where you actually use this commutator so that all of these square brackets are AB minus VA. So this relative minus sign is the uh, important part of the commutator. So we discussed, in order to describe a system with the fermions, now that we take this creation and annihilation operator to be literally operators that can create or annihilate a particle, unlike the, uh, the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, where number of particles doesn't change. So here we are really using the creation and annihilation operators to create and annihilate particle degrees of freedom. We need to find a way of describing fermions with it. And so the, the answer turned out to be that is described by this uh, anti-commutation relations between creation and annihilation operators. So these uh, curly braces are referred to AB plus BA instead of AB minus BA. So that's the difference between commutator and anti-commutator. So that's what we discussed already. <clears throat> and using this, we verified 
that Hilbert space really does look like that of a fermion, because if you start with the vacuum state that is annihilated by the annihilation operator, you can create one particle by using the creation operator. But if you try to create two particles, then you get something identically zero. And that's because of this uh, com uh, anti-commutation relation between BB and B dagger, B dagger. So this B dagger, B dagger anti-commutator is nothing but twice B dagger, B dagger. And that's what we just did by trying to create yet another particle into the same Hilbert space. And so that identically vanishes. So now we learn that the Hilbert space for a given a fermionic uh, harmonic oscillator B and B dagger has only two states. And which is really a little bit surprising because the Hilbert space you have seen in many cases always had infinite number of states, but here you have only two states. And so that's what we need for fermions. And we then went ahead and, and promoted this to the field theory. So that the path from going from the uh, harmonic oscillator at a particular position and put that on the lattice and eventually take the continuum limit goes through exactly the same way as we have done with the bosons. So here I didn't take those steps, but I just jumped ahead and wrote down this Lagrangian. So in this Lagrangian, when you write it, you have to specify where this psi field is meant to be normal field, namely Grassmann even field, which commutes at the classical level, or it is a Grassmann odd field which is a really odd number, you know, the, the, the word odd can re, uh, have a double meanings here. So, uh, so then you actually have this psi to be anti-commuting numbers. And the rule of how to use this anti-commuting numbers is that whenever you have two Grassmann even objects, you're supposed to use commutator. When you have two Grassmann odd objects, you're supposed to use anti-commutator. And when you have both even and odd fields, then you use the commutator, not anti-commutator. So the anti-commutator is used only when you are talking about the product of two objects, when both of them are Grassmann odd, then you use this anti-commutator. <clears throat> so this field theory Lagrangian for a free particle uh, uh, turned out to be uh, quantized in two different ways. One using the commutator, which leads to the, the system of the bosons, which you have looked into many, many uh, examples by, uh, by now. But we also have the case of the fermion, and that's uh, something uh, uh, we have to discuss. And in order to really verify that what we have is the uh, equivalent to the quantum mechanics of multi-fermion system, so we, again, do the same thing as we have done with the bosons. So we wrote out the two particle states by creating uh, particles at positions x1 and x2 uh, starting with this vacuum state. And you can also verify that this state indeed does have the eigenvalue two for the number operator. And then you actually take the linear superposition between this function capital psi of these general two particle states so that this is the the general state, which has two particles in it, which is now written as a linear superposition of particular uh, two, two particle states where the particles are really at positions x1 and x2. So this is what you have done with the bosons before. And we are repeating the same exercise now for this anti-commuting fields. But because of the anti-commuting nature, when you interchange these two creation operators, and that's the anti-commutator of two B daggers in the previous slide, then you're supposed to get this minus sign, which we didn't have in the case of the commuting fields, which was the description of the multi-boson system. So you get this minus sign, and then you use the fact that this X1 and X2 are meant to be dummy variables of this uh, integral when you take the linear superposition. So you relabel X2, X2 by X1, so that would actually bring this product of the operators back to where you started. But now the two arguments of this uh, 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 the function capital psi are now interchanged, but with a minus sign up front. So you learn that this function capital psi is anti-symmetric under the interchange of arguments. So uh, you know, I've shown you this to you uh, last week, so I'm just reviewing it. So this is the point where we now know for sure that 
this psi as an anti-commuting fields really do describe the system of a multi-particle identical fermions. So that's how we know that this is the, really the right way to describe the fermions using the quantum field theory language, using this creation and annihilation operators are given in terms of these fields, psi and psi dagger. Okay, so that's what we did uh, last week. Any questions about this? Is everything clear so far? Okay. Then we talked about how to understand the chemical potential. Still not introducing the interaction, but the positive chemical potential for the case of fermions. And so there, there was a little bit of surprise because in the case of the boson, once you have the positive chemical potential without repulsive interactions, we have seen this data that the bose einstein condensate would actually go to a collapse and bounces back into the Bose nova. So that's something we discussed last week. So in the case of the boson, having positive chemical potential without repulsive interaction doesn't lead to a well-defined ground state. But on the other hand, in the case of fermion, we just started discussing the ground state is well-defined because all you have to do is to keep the state vacant, not occupied, when this p squared over 2m over minus mu is positive, while you occupy that state for given momentum when p squared over 2m minus mu is negative. And that's because when this p squared over 2m minus mu is negative, you can lower the energy by putting a particle into it so you better actually put particle there. But thanks to the fact that we are now dealing with the fermions, you cannot put more than one particle into that momentum state. So that's it. That's, that's all you can do. And this is the big difference from the case of the bosons, because in the case of the boson, you can keep putting more and more particles into the state where p squared 2m minus mu is negative, so that you can keep lowering energy of the state arbitrarily, and therefore it doesn't lead to a well-defined ground state. So that's the same condition that for positive chemical potential, you don't have a ground state and the Einstein condensate would lead to a collapse is now understood in terms of the language with these uh, operators. So that's the main difference from the case of fermion and boson. So it is okay to have the positive chemical potential for fermions because you can put only one particle into the state and no more. So that's the maximum you can lower the energy of the state. So the ground state of this multi-particle system now corresponds to all the momentum modes for positive p squared minus over 2m minus mu not occupied, but all the modes where p squared of 2m minus mu negative occupied. So your state looks like this. So uh, every state up to this given momentum PF, Fermi momentum, where PF squared over 2M is exactly mu, which is called the Fermi energy. So up to that momentum mode, you occupy all of those states. So you have one particle in all of these states, which may be as large as Avogadro's number. So 6, 7, 10, 20, 3rd. So once again, quantum field theory can take care of the multi-body state very easily without writing down a wave function, which has 6, 7, 10 to, 10 to the 23 arguments in it. And that would take your lifetime and you don't have to do it. All you have to say is that we pick this vacuum state for momentum most above Fermi momentum. We pick this occupied state for all the most below the Fermi momentum. And that gives you the ground state. So this is the idea called Fermi liquid. So even when you're talking about low temperature physics and high density, fermion system looks kind of simple. You just occupy all the states up to certain energy. So that's the idea for the Fermi liquid. And so even, and given the fact that all of these states are already occupied, even if you start putting some interactions among them, it's unlikely to change the behavior of the state. So once it's occupied, it's occupied. 
you can't say this is only like ten percent occupied and stuff like this. So, uh, so this state is in some sense very sta uh, stable and robust. But as we, we come back and talk about this, the states near the Fermi surface is a little bit of suspect because you can take particle here and bring the particle up there or vice versa, even with a tiny bit of interaction among particles. So we have to come back and talk more about the region near the Fermi surface later on. And that has to do with the idea of what is called the BCS state, which ends up describing the superconductivity or superfluid of the helium-3. And we'll come back and talk about that. But anyway, so this is the ground state of fermions with the positive chemical potential, which ends up being the state where everything is occupied until you reach a certain threshold called Fermi energy. And above that energy, states are uh, empty. Okay, so that's something also we talked about last week. Uh, uh, any questions about this? So far, so good. Okay. Then we talked about actually applying this idea to the case of a, a metal by filling up all the states up to certain Fermi momentum. And then we figured out that if you put one electron per lattice site, which is the kind of situation you would expect in the case of a, a piece of metal, then it turns out that this Fermi energy is actually quite high, which corresponds to something like a 10,000 degrees. So the room temperature is actually very cold compared to this Fermi energy. So talking about metal being really the state with all the states occupied up to Fermi energy without talking about any thermal fluctuations is already a good enough description of a realistic piece of metal. And that's how we can actually uh, describe the metal being a conductor because the, once you apply an electric field, then the electrons near the Fermi surface can flow and that leads to a, an electrical current. So this is also something we talked about. And any questions about this? I'm just reviewing it so far. Are the number of states um, just computed by enumerating all the possible uh, momentum modes that are possible? That's right. So okay. the, if you put the system into a periodic box of, of, of where the, each side of the box is L, then all the momenta have to be quantized in the unit of two pi h bar over L. And these, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the ends are meant to be integers. So you can really count up how many states you have up to certain momentum a PF, basically counting the number of dots that can be inside a three-dimensional sphere. And of course, in the limit where L is large, then these dots become very dense. So you can approximate this uh, the, the discrete dots in terms of a continuum. And that's what we did in terms of counting up the number of states, which is given by this formula for a given Fermi energy mu. Does that answer your question? So, this is, so I guess this analysis is similar to, um, I think I've seen this before in terms of like phase space uh, with uh, K, X, Y, and Z. That's right. And you have like certain unit um, volume mm -hmm. for each state and you mm -hmm. just uh, just take the Fermi surface that's given by PF and then divide and get the number of states right. That's right. So the phase okay. space is given by integral over both x and p, dx dp. So I did actually show a slide last week that the phase space integral dx dp should be normalized by two pi h bar to make it dimensionless. And if you integrate over phase space dx dp over two pi h bar for all three dimensions, that corresponds to the number of quantum states in your system. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Does it suck yeah you? Okay, good. Yeah. Good. So that's exactly what we did here. And, and then that would lead to a, a you know, the, the explicit counting of states. That's this formula over here. And we just plugged in the numbers for the given number density you expect for a, a, a system on a lattice uh, with a few Armstrong as the lattice constant. And, and that would lead to this uh, uh, the prediction that the Fermi energy is very really high. Therefore, metal really does correspond to all these states, you know, packed up, up to the Fermi energy. And so that was the conclusion there. 
And then we talked a little bit about actually applying the same idea to star. And I don't repeat the discussion of this uh, uh, the, uh, stellar evolution theory. The only thing uh, you, sh you should remember is a typical star like our sun would eventually become a star called white dwarf. And once you actually get to that stage, there's no nuclear fusion process happening anymore. So you don't generate any energy. So then you have a problem that gravity would only pull and tries to make the star as small as possible unless something would resist the gravitational pull. And this resistance actually turns out to come from the, uh, the, this energy of, of the electrons filling up all the way up to the Fermi energy. So that's the, the calculation we did. So once nuclear fusion process stops, there's no heat, there's no pressure. So the entire star is supported by the degeneracy pressure of this degenerate Fermi gas, where electrons occupy all the states up to a given Fermi momentum. And then you basically balance the gravitational pull against the energy of this degenerate Fermi uh, liquid and, and to find out how the star can equilibrate itself. And so that's the calculation we have done. And in particular, it turns out that very quickly for the something of the stellar size, then the electrons end up being actually ultra relativistic. So the energy of the electron is actually given by C times the momentum because the momentum can easily exceed the mass of the electron times the speed of light. And that's how we can actually uh, obtain what is called the Chandrasekhar mass limit, that the mass of the white dwarfs cannot exceed certain mass, which is the Chandrasekhar mass, given by basically just the fundamental constants, like the Planck constant speed of light, Newton's constant of gravity, mass of the proton and neutron, and, and just the ratio of the atomic number to the mass number. And so it's really fascinating that these microscopic the, uh, constants of nature, of course, gravity is microscopic, but other things are uh, microscopic, uh, would actually give you something uh, 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 which, which gives you the mass of the star of the order of really uh, mass of the sun. So that's what we discussed as well. And this is the Mr. Chandra Sekhar. And I gave you this back of envelope way of estimating it. So this is the typical gravitational energy. And I, might, I should have probably put minus sign over here because that's the attractive potential. And I just set that equal to the energy of this Fermi, the general Fermi gas, given in terms of this Fermi momentum. And then we uh, 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 let them basically equal to each other as just dimensional estimate. And indeed the same combination comes out and that actually happens to be, roughly speaking, the mass of the sun. So that's what we did uh, on, on last week. And the reason I actually repeated this exercise, because I wanted to show you something uh, where, where this, uh, the Chandrasekhar mass is actually very important. But anyway, so any questions about what we discussed so far? Again, this is still review. Uh, what, what is the C and theta you wrote in the previous Slide. Yeah, so when you actually do a, a more uh, 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 precise calculation of the Chandrasekhar mass, then you basically have to solve the differential equation to make sure that system is in hydrostatic equilibrium. So star, of course, has certain radius and density changes as a function of the, the, the radius from the origin. So you write, uh, write down the number density of particles as a function of the radius and number density can then be translated to the Fermi momentum at that radius. So Fermi momentum is not a constant throughout the star, it's a function of the, the distance from the center. And then you compute total gravitational pull coming from the entire mass outside that radius, which has to be balanced by the pressure of the, of the electron gas inside the radius. And that turns out to be a differential equation as a function of the radius. And if you look at the lecture notes, I actually wrote that out explicitly. And when you solve the differential equation, uh, then it turns out that you can cast that into, in terms of a dimensionless parameter C. And then you, have, you find a universal solution, no matter what the mass of the star is. And then the, this theta is the solution to the differential equation. And the only this particular combination actually matters for the purpose of computing the total mass of the system. So 
what I have not done on slides, but it is done in lecture notes, is to write out the uh, differential equation for this hydrostatic equilibrium, solve that numerically, and then work out what this uh, uh, coefficient actually is, and then plug that into this formula and out came this final result on this Chandrasekhar mass limit. But as you can see, the dimensional estimate of this more uh, uh, the detailed calculation uh, only differs basically by a factor of two. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter too much, but of course, when you actually really would like to apply this idea to astrophysics, you need to work out the coefficient more precisely. And that's what was done on the previous slide using this parameter C. And what is not done on this slide, because this is just a back of envelope dimensional estimate. Is that okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the point here is that there is some maximum mass for white dwarfs. And that actually leads to this following idea. Suppose you have a binary system, and binary system is where you have two stars that are sort of circling around each other. It turns out that majority of stars in the universe are in binary systems. And so this is actually a fairly common thing. And, and just imagine a situation that in this binary system, one of them is a white dwarf, which is a very compact star, while the other one is more ordinary star made up of gas, just like our sun. So if you have a binary system like this, then you can have gas from this second star pulled by the gravitational pull from this white dwarf so that this white dwarf would see more and more stuff coming on towards its surface and, and basically gets more and more massive as time goes on. So this is the process called accretion. So we are talking about accretion of gas from this secondary star onto white dwarf so that this white dwarf becomes more and more massive as time goes on. So this can keep going until the moment when the white dwarf reaches this critical mass, the Chandrasekhar mass limit. Because beyond that mass, you cannot sustain the star against the gravitational pull anymore. So once the accretion of the gas onto the white dwarf reaches a certain critical mass, then white dwarf cannot sustain itself anymore. So what happens then is this. So here, what you see is the gas is accreting on this white dwarf companion. But once it reaches the critical mass, then it can't sustain it anymore. So it implodes. And that would all of a sudden start to ignite the nuclear fusion process that was not happening before. And then that would lead to the explosion. So this is a process called a type 1A supernova. So a star totally explodes, leaving nothing else behind. And this is just another uh, the video. Most of stars in the universe are small and insignificant, and they will eventually fizzle out without much drama. But a few light up the sky when they die. And in the process, they don't just tell us about the lives of stars. They create the building blocks of life and help us to unravel the whole history of the universe. There are something like 200 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way. Although nobody really knows exactly how many. One thing that is known though, is that a tiny fraction of these stars has a disproportionate effect on the rest of the galaxy. Similar stars in other galaxies have taught us much of what we know about the evolution of the universe. They are the stars that end their lives as supernovae, a topic in astronomy to which Hubble has made great contributions since it was launched in 1990. Now, supernovae come in two broad categories. To understand what's going on in the first category, you have to realize that a star is actually a very finely balanced thing. The pressure from the nuclear reactions at the center of the star is balanced by the star's gravity. And when a really massive star runs out of nuclear fuel, the pressure at its center drops dramatically 
and the star collapses in on itself and then explodes. The other type of supernova involves white dwarf stars, which are the remnants of stars like our own sun. Now, normally, a white dwarf is a pretty stable thing. But if one lies close to another star, it can actually pull matter off its neighbor, thereby gradually increasing its mass until finally it reaches the critical mass for a thermonuclear explosion. Okay, so, so this video talked about two types of supernovae. One of them, first one, is called core collapse. So once the nuclear fusion process stops, it runs out of fuel, the nuclear fusion process stops, then it can sustain its gravity and it collapses and then bounces back. And that's the first kind of a supernova uh, called core collapse. And the white dwarf version is different. It is actually because of this accretion coming from another star and that reaches this Chandrasekhar mass limit. And then again, it implodes and then explodes. And, and so that's how the, uh, these different types of supernovae happen. But in the case of this latter type with the white dwarfs, the mass of the star before explosion is something we have computed. There's a Chandrasekhar mass limit. So no matter what kind of system you're looking at, it always ends up being the Chandrasekhar mass before it explodes. So the explosion of the star is very universal. It doesn't have much personality from one star to another. And as a result, these type 1a supernovae are believed to have more or less the same brightness, no matter which one you look at. And that actually turned out to be an extremely useful thing because when you see a type 1a supernova like this, and you can also see that this is actually incredibly bright, which is as bright as the entire galaxy combined. So that's why you can see this uh, exploding type 1a supernovae, even when they happen at a very, very distant uh, universe, distant galaxies. But once you actually see it, then you, you are actually looking at the apparent brightness, but you know it's intrinsic brightness. So it's sort of like knowing that, okay, this is a 100 watt light bulb. And when the 100 watt light bulb looks very bright, that means it's close to you. When a 100 watt light, a light bulb is very dim, then that means it's far away from you. So just by measuring the brightness of this exploding star, you are actually measuring the distance to these faraway galaxies. And that's actually a very non-trivial thing because one of the most difficult things in astronomy is to measure distance. You can't get there and come back in order to measure distance. So you have to rely on some indirect method. And this is one of the very reliable ways of uh, actually measuring the distance. And I don't go actually into uh, further discussions, but it is actually a sole perimeter in our department who used this idea of measuring distance to uh, galaxies using this type 1a supernovae. And so then you know the distance to the galaxy. And of course, in, in the case of the universe, you're talking about distance of let's say uh, uh, 10 billion light years away or something. Then you know that you are observing a supernova that happened 10 billion years ago. So that's the way you actually get information on the timing of this explosion. But at the same time, light emitted from the supernovae has been traveling through space over 10 billion years. And in those 10 billion years, universe got expanded, so it became bigger. And as a result, all the light that actually came through the, this universe also gets stretched by the same amount and the wavelength becomes longer. And that is an effect called redshift. So even though the light emitted from the star may be originally blue, because the universe gets bigger while the light is traveling through, uh, through space towards us, then the blue light may become red light with a longer wavelength. So as a result, just by measuring the spectrum of the light coming from this uh, supernova, you are basically measuring how much universe has expanded since. So you get two pieces of information from supernova. First thing is thanks to this, uh, uh, this issue of the Chandrasekhar mass limit, you know the intrinsic brightness and therefore just by observing the star, you know the distance to it. So you have timing information because of that. 
And second, just by measuring the spectrum of light, you know by what fact the universe has gotten bigger since the time of the supernova explosion. So you have information on timing, you have information on, on the expansion. Putting that together, you now have information on expansion history. And just and by looking at this expansion history, the soul discovers something really, really surprising, namely that expansion of the universe is speeding up. It's accelerating. And so that was the discovery of the accelerating universe, which earned him a Nobel Prize already. And so that, that's the story. So the fact that these type 1a supernovae happen because of the Chandrasekhar mass limit gives them very universal behavior in terms of how bright they are. That's why you can use them as what is called a standard candle. So you know it's a 100 watt light bulb. And using that fact, you can measure distance and therefore you know the timing of the supernova explosion. And combining that with information on the redshift that tells you how much universe expanded since, you get the expansion history. And everybody believed before source measurement that universe has to be uh, slowing down. But instead he discovered the universe was speeding up. And that's a huge surprise. And of course, that's why it was Nobel Prize worthy. So the reason I spent some time reviewing what we discussed last week, because I wanted to lead up to this story about the source Nobel Prize, and, uh, uh, and, and it was really useful to understand this, the, uh, the, the uh, degenerate Fermi gas as the, the mechanism for the white dwarfs, which leads to the Chandrasekhar mass limit, and therefore we can actually use it for practical purposes of measuring distances in astronomy, which then led to this amazing discovery of the accelerating universe. Okay, any questions about this story? Okay. All right, so then let me move on. Now I switch gear from a star to nucleus. And in quantum mechanics class, I'm sure you learned a lot about atomic energy levels. In the case of a hydrogen atom, you have this exact solution uh, in, and you're starting from 1s uh, uh, state in 2s, 2p, 3s, 3, 3p, 3d, and so on and so forth. So you found these energy levels. And you also uh, have learned about this idea of the closed shell, which gives you basically the, uh, the, the uh, um, uh, noble gas, like a, a helium, neon, argon, uh, krypton, xenon, radon, and they are very stable atoms, which don't actually uh, have much of the, the chemical reaction with the other uh, the atoms, because it's a closed shell atoms, and, and, and so in some sense they are self-complete, and you don't need to have chemical reactions to make them stable. So it turns out that you can apply a very similar idea to nuclear physics too. And the reason why this idea of the closed shell worked in the case of atomic physics is again because of this Fermi statistics that you can put only one electron for a given state. And for a given orbital, electron can have either spin up or spin down. So you can put two electrons into the same orbital. And once you fill up to certain energy levels where you have a wide gap to the next energy level, then you say that's a closed shell atom and it becomes chemically very inactive and stable. So the, these two people, and uh, the, the Maria Gep Gephardt Meyer and Hans Jensen, sort of try to come up and, and replicate this success story of understanding atomic levels to atomic nuclei instead. And as you all know, the atomic nuclei are very uh, uh, dense composite object made up of protons and neutrons and the protons and neutrons actually do have finite size uh, of the order of uh, uh, 10 to minus 13 centimeter. And inside atomic nuclei, protons and neutrons are sort of shoulder to shoulder. So they're sort of touching with each other. So it's a very different kind of bound state compared to atomic electrons. So atomic electrons, the electrons move so far away from atomic nucleus. So atomic nucleus, as I said, is about 10 to minus 13 centimeter. The ball radius is 10 to minus eight centimeter. So there's a, um, almost five orders of magnitude difference between where electrons are versus how big the atomic nucleus is. 
But inside this atomic nucleus, their protons and neutrons are really packed together, shoulder to shoulder. So it's a, actually a much more difficult pro uh, system to understand compared to the uh, uh, atomic energy levels. So they came up with the idea called the nuclear shell model. The idea of the shell model is that, well, it's, it looks like it's a very difficult to understand nuclei from the first principles. So let's set up a, the following idea and see if that works at all. So you first set up a harmonic oscillator potential. And then in harmonic oscillator, of course, you know exactly what the energy levels are. And the idea is that you start putting neutrons and protons in these energy levels of the harmonic oscillator. And I show you energy levels of harmonic oscillator on the next slide. So that's the starting point of discussion. But harmonic oscillator is meant to be just a beginning of an approximation. So the next thing you do is that, well, we know you can take protons and neutrons out of the atomic nucleus, which means the potential cannot be rising to infinity. It has to flatten out. Otherwise, you can never take protons and neutrons out of a nucleus. So the second thing you do is from the harmonic oscillator potential, you flatten out the behavior of the potential at long distances. And then you find that is something more like a, uh, 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 a spherical shell potential. And that's part of the reason for this shell model name. So now you have this potential. And you can ask the question, how do the energy levels of harmonic oscillator change when you actually flatten out the long distance behavior? And that's simple to answer. So at a, at a given energy level in a harmonic oscillator, you typically have states of different orbital angular momentum. And that's also something you're familiar in the case of the Coulomb potential. So at a given principal quantum number n, you can have L ranges from zero to n, uh, 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 zero to n minus one, right? So, so uh, at a given energy level, you have states with different uh, orbital angular momentum they generate with each other. But when you flatten out the potential at long distances, it turns out that higher L states are farther away from the origin because of the centri centrifugal uh, uh, bear, uh, uh, force. And so the, the states with a higher L would decrease their energies when you flatten out the potential at long distances. So at a given level of harmonic oscillator levels where you have you know, different uh, orbital angular, angular momenta being degenerate, but once you flatten out this long distance portion, the, uh, uh, the states with higher L would start to come down in energy levels. So that's the second thing that can happen. And in addition to this flattening out of the potential, you further put in additional interaction called spin orbit coupling, which is just a term in a Hamiltonian that looks like L dot S. So L is the orbital angular momentum, S is a spin angular momentum. So that would actually further change the energy levels, which is shown on this part of the slide. So when spin is oriented in opposite direction to the orbital angular momentum, energy increases. But when the spin is oriented in the same direction as the orbital angular momentum, energy decreases. So you put in this particular sign for the spin orbit coupling in addition to this oval potential. Then you find that energy levels move around uh, somewhat because of this additional spin orbit coupling. But then you see that there's actually a wide gap among the energy levels once you fill up all the states up to a certain number. And then that kind of situation would roughly speaking correspond to the closed shell in atomic energy levels, like a noble gas. And that should give you particularly stable nuclear uh, states. So on the next slide, I'm gonna show you how those numbers come about, but that would give you what is called the magic numbers. Namely that if you have a system of two protons, that is particularly stable. And eight protons would also give you a particularly stable state. Six is not that stable. Seven 
even less stable, and so on and so forth. So if we have a nucleus, which has the number of protons that equal these magic numbers, 2, 8, 20, 28, 50, 82, 126, then you have a particularly stable nucleus. And you have the same argument for neutrons too. So in particular, there are special nuclei where both the number of neutrons and number of protons are these magic numbers then those nuclei are really stable compared to many other uh, nuclear states. So that's the idea called magic numbers. So anyway, I, I'm gonna show you how these numbers come about on the next slide, but uh, any questions about this general idea? So we put, we model nuclei as a states given in terms of this kind of spherical potential and you keep putting protons and neutrons uh, into this potential from the lowest energy levels and gradually upwards, just like what you do in atomic case. And that follows this idea of this exclusion principle that you can put only one fermion into a given state. No questions so far? Oh, uh, yeah. Anna, I was... oh. Go ahead, um, Anna? Yeah, um, oh, I guess I just read a little bit more of the, um, of the graph and it maybe explained itself to me, but I was just wondering what the difference, is it just adding the Coulomb repulsion that produces this difference between the proton and the neutron? You're asking repulsion? about this difference between proton and neutron. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so protons have electric charge and neutrons don't. So when you try to uh, stack up protons into this potential well, they repel with each other. So that's why the potential energy protons are under are higher because of the Coulomb repulsion coming from all the other protons inside this nucleus. And in addition, that will also give you this one over R behavior of the Coulomb potential once the proton is outside the nucleus. So that is actually a very interesting thing when you think about, for example, nuclear fusion process. So in the sun, at the core of the sun, two protons are supposed to fuse or one proton should be attached to a helium and stuff like this, but for a proton to be able to get into the nucleus, you have to tunnel through this potential barrier. So the nuclear fusion process that is powering the sun is actually due to quantum mechanical tunneling due to this Coulomb potential. And so that's why it requires this enormous pressure and, and the temperature of the core of the sun to be able to actually do nuclear fusion. And of course, all of us mere mortals are trying to mimic what is going on in the sun by creating a nuclear fusion reactor, which will be, of course, the energy source of the future, because you can just rely on the hydrogen to produce almost, you know, unbounded amount of energy from the fusion process. And there are a lot of experiments being done today, uh, trying to make this sustained nuclear fusion process happening in the laboratory. And, and it, it turns out that's a very difficult thing to do because you have to heat up the gas to this incredibly high temperature. So if that gas would hit the container, the container would evaporate in, in an instant. So how to contain this incredibly high temperature gas is a very technically difficult challenge. And the right now, the best idea seems to be a magnetic confinement. Uh, so you have this plasma state where electrons and protons are moving independently from each other, but they are electrically charged objects. So if they are moving around in the magnetic field, then you can make sure that they wouldn't touch the container uh, so that you can heat it up to incredibly high temperature without ever touching it and still contain it. And then you hope that the nuclear fusion can happen in a sustained fashion inside this container. So there's an experiment called ITER, e I T E R. International Thermonuclear, uh, I forgot what E was, in R's reactor in, in Cadarache, France, uh, which is the international multi billion dollar project where people are trying to actually achieve this sustained nuclear fusion as the possible energy source for the future uh, to avoid any uh, carbon production. So that, that's this, the significance of this difference between the proton potential well, the neutron potential well, is, is really that the nuclear fusion process happens to be a uh, tunneling process. 
Okay, I, I went a little to the side story, but uh, did I answer your question, Anna? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay. And Ryan, you had a question too? Apparently not. No, I didn't. Yeah, no, oh, I didn't. Okay. Oh, and, any further questions on this? Um, I just had a question about the gaps that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and how they lead to these magic numbers. I guess, could you yeah, just so, clarify yeah, that? So, yeah, so that, that will come up on the next slide. So if I okay, can go sure. to the next slide, you'll see the gaps. Yeah. Any other questions at this stage of just the ideas I talked about? Okay, let me go to the next slide and you might actually want to come back later. So this is how it goes. So this is the harmonic oscillator levels. H bar omega, two H bar omega, three H bar omega, dot, dot, dot. So these are harmonic oscillators. And then you can count up the number of states. So because this is a three dimensional harmonic oscillator for going from one S state to the one uh, the uh, first excited state, you have three creation annihilation operators to reach the same energy level. So going from ground state to here, you actually have three states. And in addition, of course, you have up and down spins for each state. So here you have six states altogether. So the ground state is two states for spin up and down for proton, two more states for spin up and down for neutron. First excited state comes with three orbital states, each with spin up and down. So there are six states altogether. And uh, the summing up this first ground state and the first excited states, the first ground state has two states as I said for spin up and down and the first excited has six states. So the total up to this stage would be eight for proton and another eight for neutron. If you go to the second excited state, then you can use two creation operators out of three so you can do the combinatorics very simply. So there are six possible ways of creating the uh, second uh, 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 um, excited state. And then those six states turn out to correspond to one combination in D state. So L equals two and L equals two comes with two L plus one, that's five states. And another one is the S state. So L equals zero, that gives you one state. So one plus five is six indeed. So at this level of the second excited state, you have degenerate S states and D states. And again, you can count the number of states. So up to this level, you have 30 states, uh, 20 states altogether. This is typo, I believe, 20 states altogether. So now you already start to see these magic numbers come, uh, are coming out. So if you have two states occupied, then that corresponds to the closed shell for this ground state, 1S. If you have eight states that are occupied, then you have occupied all 1S states and all 1P states, and that's the closed shell, and with a big gap to the next one. Again, if you actually fill up all the way up to a, a 20 uh, states, and then you filled up 1S, first state, a ground state, first excited state, and second excited state, and that would give you, again, a very stable configuration of the closed shell. If you get to the third excited state, it turns out the third excited state is made of three states for L equal one and seven states of L equal three. And they are degenerate for a harmonic oscillator. But because we flatten out the potential at the long radii, a, a, a large radii, as I said, the higher L states come down in their energies so even though this 2P and 1F states used to be degenerate in harmonic oscillator, after you flatten out the potential along radius, uh, radius, then F states come down more than P states. So P states and F states start to develop a energy gap in between. In addition, we put in this spin orbit coupling and F states have L equal three. So L is pretty big. As a result, spin orbit coupling is also pretty big. And as this picture says, when the spin and orbital angular momentum are parallel, you decrease the energy. And when spin and orbital angular momentum are parallel, then you add them up. So if you add L equal three with spin one half, then end result is either spin two uh, seventh 
was spin to halves. And, 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 and because when the spin and, and orbital angular momentum the parallel gives you lower energy, this seven half angular momentum state comes down quite a bit. So as a result, this F seven half state develops a pretty big gap to the next energy state of P three halves. So this can be viewed as a yet another closed shell. And that's a new magic number 28. And you keep doing it. So starting from this harmonic oscillator, that's easy to understand. You can look at what the orbital angular momentum is for a given harmonic oscillator level. And you bring down the higher L states because of the flattening of, of this potential. And then you add the orbital angular momentum and spin. And when they add up to a, 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 a bigger J, then that state comes down quite a bit so that they tend to join the lower energy levels of the harmonic oscillator. So that's how you develop these big gaps among the energy levels with this kind of potential together with spin orbit coupling. And that in turn gives you these magic numbers of 2, 8, 30, 28, 50, 82, and so on. And so that's how you get these magic numbers, which actually turned out to agree very well with what people have observed uh, in stable nuclei in nuclear physics experiments. And some of the nuclei are doubly magic because in the case of helium-4, you have two protons and two neutrons. So both proton and neutron have the magic numbers too. So this is actually very, very stable nucleus. Oxygen-16, the same way, you have eight protons and eight neutrons. Again, doubly magic. Calcium-40, both of them are 20, doubly magic. Calcium-48 has 20 protons and 28 neutrons. So that's also doubly magic and so on and so forth. And the biggest uh, known doubly magic nucleus is the lead 208. And so 208 is 126 uh, protons, uh, neutrons, I'm sorry, 126 neutrons and 82 protons adding up to 208 uh, mass number. And that's also a very stable nucleus. So this is the prediction out of the shelf model and that really uh, explain these magic numbers, which was known in nuclear physics. And, and the, hence, of course, Nobel Prize was awarded to these uh, uh, two people uh, uh, in uh, uh, a Nobel Prize in physics. Okay, so does that answer the question? I forgot who that was. Was it Benjamin? Okay, any further questions here? Okay, good. So once again, this is based on the same idea we talked about in the case of the, the electrons in metal, electrons in white dwarfs, electrons in atomic energy levels, this time protons and neutrons in nuclear energy levels, and all of them are based on the same principle that you have a Fermi energy and in, you stack up all the states up to the Fermi energy uh, in, as a ground state of this, uh, the, the, the uh, quantum field theory of fermions with a positive chemical potential. Okay, any questions overall about this idea of stacking up fermions up to energy, uh, the Fermi energy? Um, so are the harmonic oscillator levels, uh, I guess, three-dimensional, so that means mm -hmm. all I guess all um, in both X, Y, and Z directions, we must be in the excited state uh, in right. order to achieve like one H bar omega. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the Hamiltonian okay. is very simple. It's just H bar omega, the common H bar omega, which multiplies AX dagger AX, that's a harmonic oscillator in X direction, AY dagger AY, harmonic oscillator in Y direction, AZ dagger AZ, that's a harmonic oscillator in Z direction. So you have these three independent harmonic oscillators. And, and so that would give you these, all of these energy states, which you can easily work out. Oh, okay, I see. Right, any further questions? Good, so let me move on. So we talked about the uh, idea of stacking up all the states up to the Fermi energy, but it turns out that there's actually a very convenient language for this, 
called hole. You know, hole literally, literally is a hole in the ground. So in this case, we learn the ground state is what we just talked about. So you keep the states above Fermi energy empty, vacant, and you fill the states below the Fermi energy. So this is actually occupied. And that gives you this ground state we talked about. But when you actually try to describe this situation, then it is slightly inconvenient to talk about, you know, the filled state up to Fermi energy and empty state for the uh, 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 above uh, Fermi energy. This is actually ground state of the system, but not the, uh, the vacuum state. So if you do it actually a trick, it turns out that this Fermi degenerate state can be viewed as actually a vacuum state, which becomes in handy when you start talking about excitations of this uh, uh, system. So the trick is you just relabel creation operator by an annihilation operator, and annihilation operator by a creation operator. Sounds crazy, but it turns out that when you actually look at this uh, canonical anti-commutation relation, DD dagger anti-commutator before the relabeling that's actually B dagger B anti-commutator but anti-commutator is relatively plus sign between two products so AB anti-commutator and BA anti-commutator are the same right so AB anti-commutator is AB plus BA BA anti-commutator is BA plus AB and they're the same thing so when you were dealing with this anti-commutator, I can freely relabel this B by B, D dagger, B dagger by D, but then you switch around the order in anti-commutator without changing the result. So it turns out that after doing this relabeling, anti-commutation relation come out to be the same. You can do this trick in the case of boson because of the relative minus sign. If you try to play this trick, then DD dagger commutator will be minus one. That doesn't work. So only when you are dealing with this anti-commutator, which means only when you're talking about fermions, you can do this trick or relabeling creation operator by annihilation operator, annihilation by operator by creation operator, and you still have the same canonical anti-commutation relation. And the reason why this is useful is then you can say that ground state of the system is actually a vacuum state. None of the particles are occupied because this condition that this state already has one particle occupied means when you act B dagger on this, it vanishes, right? Because you can't raise any more. You can't put more than one particle into the state. But we decide to relabel B dagger by D. So the condition is now, this state is annihilated by D. That's this condition. So in terms of this B operator, this state is an occupied state. But in, in terms of this D operator, this is actually the vacuum state. So then this actually becomes easier to deal with because all you have to say is that, okay, the ground state of the system is the vacuum state. No particles are occupied now. Once you do this, use this language, then this D of P is an annihilation operator of something. But when you actually use this D of P, what you are doing is actually, uh, uh, is, is the, to go from state zero to one. So the state zero, what used to be the original state zero, uh, you can act B dagger on it, which is D, to go to state one. So what D operator does is the opposite of what B operator did. So instead of actually annihilating a particle, we say this operator annihilates a hole. And, and so let me actually uh, uh, summarize this in the following way. So this idea becomes probably, hopefully, uh, easier to understand when you talk about this kind of configuration. So for the ground state, 
this momentum mode is not occupied. So when you create a particle in this state, then this is an excited state. And you can create this excited state by using the creation operator of B operator. On the other hand, when all of these states are occupied, then that was the ground state. And if you take this electron or neutron or whatever, if you take this fermion out of this, then you actually increase the energy because P squared of 2m minus mu is negative. So this is also a, a, a form of excited state. So removing this particle would actually create an excitation of the system. And when you use this language of D operator instead, this configuration is the vacuum state of D particle. And creating this, uh, uh, removing this fermion then corresponds to acting D dagger on the ground state. Because D dagger is actually B which corresponds to removing this fermion. So it turns out that D dagger is the creation of an excitation which corresponds to digging a hole in this Fermi degenerate state. That's why we say D is the creation operator of a hole. And when you think of this being, let's say, electron in the metal, Removing an electron means the electron had the momentum P, you're removing it. So this hole has a momentum negative P. And I already used this fact here. The creation operator of a hole of momentum P is the same thing as operator removing an electron of momentum minus P. So hole and the particle, original particle, have opposite momenta. It also has the opposite electric charge. When you have electrons occupied all the way up to this state, all of these electron charges would be added up, and that's the ground state. But when you remove an electron, then this state has removed one electrical charge of electron. So relative to the ground state, this hole would add a charge that's negative E. That's the opposite of the electric charge of electron. So whole, defined this way, has all the quantum numbers reversed. Electric charge is the opposite. Momentum is the opposite. If you also have a spin, spin would be opposite too. So this is the idea called whole. And you have this annihilation and creation operators of whole and the hole has opposite charge, opposite momentum, and opposite energy from that of the particle. And uh, I'm just repeating the Fermi energy here. I didn't have to actually show it. So that's the idea called hole. And the reason why this is actually a useful thing to do, even though it looks like it's just a pure mathematical trick, is that you can just talk about this ground state to be a vacuum state. And from this vacuum, you can create excitations by creating the particles and holes. And that's the language used very commonly in condensed matter physics, talking about, for example, semiconductor. And you, I'm sure you have heard of this P-type and N-type semiconductor, where the charge carriers are either positive for P or negative for N. And of course, charge carriers are supposed to be electrons in you know, ordinary solid state system. So how come there's a positive charge carrier? A positive charge carrier is actually this hole. So once you actually stack up electrons up to some energy levels, removing an electron is a hole, which gives you a positive charge because you have removed negative charge of the electron. And then you have a system where the charge carrier is actually positively charged because it's a hole. So instead of talking about electrons flowing to give you electric current, then you can talk about this hole flowing in this system it also gives you electric current. Then you're talking about P-type superconductor where the charge carrier is positive because it's actually a hole made of electrons originally.
So this is probably the place to stop and ask and see if there are any questions. Yeah, could you um, just explain the like B acting on the zero state equals D acting on the zero state? I thought that we were equating B and D dagger. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's an excellent question. Thank you for asking because from here to here, I changed notation. So that's what I forgot to mention, I think. That's why that caused confusion. So thank you for asking the question. So at this level, when we first talked about the ground state, where states up to the Fermi level is occupied and states above the Fermi level are not occupied, we use this notation that zero corresponds to no particle, the vacuum state, and one corresponds to a state that's occupied with one particle for a given mode. So that's the original definition of zero and one kets. But after this relabeling, state that's annihilated, so that's a state that is already occupied using B operator, so that acting B dagger on it would give you zero, is the same state, which is annihilated by D operator, because D operator is the same thing as B dagger. So what used to be the state one for occupied state is now an empty state as far as this hole is concerned. So if the state is already occupied by the electron, that's the same thing as not having a hole. Because putting all electrons all the way through up to Fermi energy level is the state of the ground state. That's the state with no holes. And that's the ground state zero here. So I apologize that I changed notation from zero one to this zero here, but this zero state is what corresponds to state that's occupied with an electron. But now we relabel the state as a state that's annihilated by the annihilation operator of the hole, because there is no hole. Does that address your question, Anna? Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I, I, I can see this can be confusing. And it turns out that this, the same argument we are going to use later on when we get to relativistic quantum field theory, where this hole actually turns out to be antimatter. And that's the positron antimatter of electron, which indeed does have a positive charge. So in this case of talking about this Fermi degeneracy or metal or something, then using this hole is just a matter of convenience. It's just more convenient to think of this, this the one state, one electron removed be a one hole instead of talking about all the other electrons moving the opposite direction. So that's why using the hole is a much better language for the purpose of uh, uh, using, uh, for example, describing a piece of metal or semiconductor in condensed matter physics. But in the case of the relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, qu uh, quantum field theory we get to later on, then the ground state of the system actually turns out to be also very similar in a way, and creating a hole actually corresponds to the antiparticle. And, and we'll come back and talk about this later, but I'm just giving you this teaser that the idea of the hole ends up being actually essential. So at this point, this is a matter of convenience, but later on becomes essential for the purpose of actually dealing with relativistic quantum field theory. Any further questions at this stage? Um, yeah, that's the reason. Oh, uh, yeah. Ryan, go. Uh, no, just Sahel just asked another question. I can I can let him ask first. That's fine. Okay, who, who okay. was the other person? Uh, yeah, I guess I guess it was me. Um, go ahead. So I just wanted to ask, um, what what's the reason for the negation of p between the two operators again? Yeah, so once you actually remove an electron that has an, a momentum P, then you subtracted the momentum from the ground state. So the end result is a state with negative P momentum. So that's why when you use the language of hole, then creating a hole of momentum P requires removing the electron of momentum minus P. That's why the argument here is now reversed between B operator and D operator. 
I see. So the that zero cat, yes, yeah, so the zero cat, I guess, for the rest of the slide, after we define what the ground state is, is referring mm -hmm. to this uh, Fermi liquid ground state, right? That's right. In all cases. Okay. Yeah, I guess I was confused at first because yeah, I thought yeah. it was like the normal uh, ground state. But yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you for asking the question, too. And back to Ryan. Yeah, so is the scenario you join the picture can happen physically in our world? Because I think this process does not actually follow the conservation of momentum. You remove an electron uh, which has momentum less than PF, and you create an electron which has um, momentum bigger than PF. So can this really happen in a physical system? Uh, no, no, this, this is really a consequence of momentum conservation. No, no, so, I mean the picture. Oh. I mean, yeah, the picture. The picture you just draw. I mean, this process, it is like you create a hole uh, in the firm, um, in the Fermi C and you create another electron. That oh, is above I, I, the Fermi. okay. I think I know what you're talking about. So this picture is drawn in one dimensional axis for the momentum. And what I had in mind that this is the absolute value of P in three dimensions. So when you remove this electron here with momentum P, that's an excitation with momentum minus P, but along this one dimensional axis of absolute size of the P, it is the same place. Yeah, yeah. So that's but... why it looks confusing. So this hole really does have negative P but along this one dimensional axis, it appears at the same place. Yeah, I see. But I mean, this process does not like preserve the conservation of momentum, right? Because- What do you mean by process? So uh, far, I only described the state. Okay, so I, compared to the ground state, the real vacuum state, that you remove an electron, then you create a hole, and you put mm -hmm. the electron above the uh, Fermi mode. This is a new excitation. This is a new state. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So what you can do uh, if you have a piece of metal like this one, just imagine you send in a photon to the system and that photon would kick out this electron mm -hmm. and make it into this state. Then using this language, uh, that's the same thing as the pair creation of an electron and a hole. And because photon carries momentum into the system, then final state, of course, has net momentum gain relative to the original firm degenerate C. And that momentum of the photon would be equal to the momentum of the electron you created minus the momentum of electron you destroyed. And the momentum of uh, uh, electron you destroyed is the negative of the momentum of the whole. So you can now describe the momentum conservation law by saying that momentum of the photon turned into the momentum of an electron plus momentum of the whole. So that's the way you can conserve energy and momentum. Does that answer yeah, your question, yeah. Ryan? Yeah, 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 I see. So this is like actually a like indirect transition in the semiconductor, something pretty That's right, like that. right, oh, right. Yeah, yeah I see. And, and this way of describing the Fermi system using the whole is not specific to condensed matter physics. Remember the case of the atomic energy levels. Let's say you have neon, that is the closed shell, and we know that's very stable. And relative to neon, you can describe fluorine as a state with one hole out of the closed shell where you have occupied all the oneness states and two P states, you take one electron out. So you can view this as a state with one hole. And that's why when you're of course talking about the chemistry, then fluorine would ionize to fluorine negative. And you can really view this state as taking a hole away as an ionization process. So if you're just below the closed shell, you can talk about your atomic states with this hole. If you are just above the closed shell, like alkali elements, like sodium, then it's easier to talk about it using one electron bound to the rest of the, the state. 
But if you're just below the, the closed shell, you can use again the language of the whole. Same thing in nuclear physics. I mentioned oxygen 16 as a doubly magic nucleus, very stable. If you take two protons out of it, and that's carbon 14, famous in radioactive dating. So you can describe carbon 14 as a system of the closed shell with two holes of the proton attached to it. And you can study that as if it is just a two nucleon system without talking about the rest of the 14 nucleons in it. So using the language of whole is actually pretty useful, not just in the semiconductor or metal, but also everything which has this degenerate Fermi C because it's basically the same idea of how to describe the physical systems. So in the current homework problem, you're supposed to verify that you can do this relabeling without causing any problems. But I hope you see the virtue of actually checking that uh, by looking at this kind of example where description of system becomes a lot easier. Rather than talking about Avogadro number of electrons, you can only talk about a few numbers of electrons and holes. And that's a lot easier, of course, to deal with in terms of talking about the scattering of electron and hole and conduction and so on and so forth. And all the transport processes in a semiconductor is much better described using the language of hole rather than this incredible number of electrons in it. Okay, so let me stop here and uh, that we'll see you again on Friday. So any questions, you're welcome to ask. No? Okay, I see you on Friday. Bye.